Sarah Hussein Idris, how are you? Welcome. I have in my hand your thesis documents. Oh my gosh, they're a mess, I know. <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> Only problem is you never graduated. What I you... never I never signed it. Oh my God, it's For all some reason. Out. So I, I have now officially graduated you 22 years later, I think. Okay. <laughs> so Finally. I just, just so there's no confusion down the line. <laughs> and the reason that I have it is that for these students, I want them to know what kind of model paper it is. Um, Sarah did her thesis in video, three-part video called I Am I, little I, little A-M, little I. And I would recommend to all thesis students present and all those who will be in this role next year to read this thesis as a very well written, very well organized and very clear um, presentation of what she did in terms of three, a three part, three separate videos. And it's just briefly, I think you all know by now that uh, Sarah runs her own, uh, what they call Golden Tusk, she calls Golden Tusk Lab, where she does editing, directing, makes films for commercial reasons, for documentary reasons, and her own personal films. And her career is kind of exemplary in the sense that she's managed to integrate all of that and still keep her soul in her own personal vision of an identity as a filmmaker or video maker. I shouldn't use the word film. And I looked through the thesis today and I found it particularly timely in terms of the things that we're all considering in terms of representation, in terms of identity, in terms of race and ethnicity. And I just want to read you, instead of going into the long history of her illustrious career, and I'm very proud of her career for her. And she will tell you more about that, I think, in today's discussion. But a good thesis is a good platform for jumping off into the real world, which Sarah did very effectively. And I just want to read a few things that she wrote, which I think are particularly timely in the, in the social political sense, but also to how you all may envision where you might be in 22 years, or for that matter, 50 years, or for that matter, four years. Uh, I just outlined a few things. How are the current blurring of boundaries between people, categories, and discipline, bliss, dis, bruh, disciplines affect our understanding of ourselves and others? How as artists do we begin to describe our present circumstances? And as you know, that's key to everything that's going on in our social political world. I'm just skipping through reading a few particular lines. Apparently her first film that she watched as a child in cartoon with her parents was King Kong. I think that might have been one of my first too, by the way. I quickly became aware that to many people, both black and white, Africa resembles Skull Island, the home of King Kong. Literature, television, art, film, all supported misconceptions of a mythical, exotic, and ancient Africa, that of Hollywood, some poets and writers and some of poets and writers, the heart of darkness, National Geographic, and the home of Tarzan. However, to many others, Africa also represents the homeland, the birthplace of civilization, idealized notions of home, of, cultural, of culture intact. It offers acceptance, helps subside feelings of displacement, and represents an opportunity to experience being a majority. It is the destination of Marcus Garvey's Black Star Line. One of the interesting things about this 
thesis, and I'm going to put it in the glass case where all the current uh, literature I've put in there, photographers and other things in terms of Black Lives Matter uh, belong in terms of Black history, uh, because this thesis paper is full of references that all of us should be aware of and might look further into. The misrepresentation of Africans through photography and other visual arts has had an enormous impact on our consciousness and has directly affected our perceptions of the continent, its inhabitants and descendants. Just one or two more. Finally, just one more actually, I think. In the end, she wrote, I feel as though my thesis work this year is just the research for future work. I have found a form in these short abstracted narratives that I want to continue to explore. And that's exactly what Sarah has done and how she has pursued her life, jumping off from this early platform, which she created for herself while a student in our department. I'm so happy to have her here. Thank you, Sarah. Oh my God, thank you. That was very surreal. I haven't read or, you know, seen a lot or just kind of remembered all these things. And it is kind of, I'm like a little, you know, shaky because it's so true. I guess it's something I, I saw. I didn't think I knew back then, I guess, how definitive of a path I wanted, but I guess I did, you know, and I think, um, thank, thank you sure. for reading that to me because that was that just kind of reinforced a lot, um, fighting back some tears. But okay, um, well, part of why I was happy to do this today, besides COVID and having a bunch of new people to talk to, besides my five year old and husband, is um, I remember the feeling of being where you guys are. Um, I remember, and especially during this time, I think it's in a way a luxury to have people sit and talk to you and allow you to um, you know, express yourself in any which way you want to, as well as give you feedback and give you time and allow you and point you and mentor you. Um, and I, yeah, I guess it's been quite a while for me, but you know, in the real world and outside and in whatever version of, of art you're gonna um, make, you know, it's never, uh, as pure, you know, it's always going to be with the idea that you're trying to create a product or finish um, something uh, in a collaboration, you're either meeting your own vision or someone else's. And I think, so I, I say all of that to just say, cherish the time you have now, it really is a luxury, as well as experiment and F it all up, like, do as much experimentation, push yourself because you're really not going to have this kind of time again. Um, unless you go back for a residency, which I did there as well. But it is a really kind of a good restart and re kind of reset time for you. Um, so for, with that, I say thank you for allowing me to talk to you guys. I know you guys are from all over the world and everyone's all over the states. So apologies if this is a crazy time. But um, so yeah, so I'll start off with just a little bit about me um, and just to give you an idea of where I guess my point of view and how I look at things. Um, and I really wanna do, I wanted to kind of have a conversation today really more about um, opening up ideas and opening you up to ideas of how to present and how to really think about your work in a way that can make you more most effective. The biggest thing for me is really learning and over the years figuring out how to access the things that I want to communicate and how to make sure that I have a more direct line of access with myself, really, because that's what you're going to draw on. And because when you make work and as you hopefully become successful in whatever you do, you're going to need to access that sometimes quickly. And that path, that kind of trained path in your mind starts in moments like now where you are, where you start to kind of learn how to um, you know, access these kind of points and these feelings and figure out how to communicate them. So most of what I was going to talk about today is that. Um, so to start, I in the in the chat, I don't know if everyone had a chance and if you didn't, it's okay, I'll go over some of the videos, I'm going to play a little bit of them and then you can always go back to that link. But in the chat, I've put the link 
um, to where I put the videos and also it has a password. Uh, I'm going to share my screen, which has very similar videos and some other photos, but just so you have that as the background. Um, so yeah, so I'll just, you know, Charlie did a, you know, an amazing job. I wasn't expecting it um, of kind of telling my story in a way. Um, but I guess for me, the first thing I consider myself to be is an image maker. And I think that's kind of the most consistent thing about all that I've done. Uh, in the end, I either create my own images or I help or interpret or help someone else kind of perfect theirs. And, you know, it started very young for me doing drawing, collage, poetry, writing. Um, but as Charlie said, I, I, you know, I'm an immigrant. I was born and raised in Sudan. I came here when I was eight. I learned English in the States. Um, I have, I'm one of four. So um, I don't come from a family that is, you know, artists necessarily. And, you know, we came under good circumstances unlike other, um, you know, immigration stories, but I still had that expectation of achieving and success and being successful. So I always knew I had a vocation or something to do artistic work, but I always felt like I had to back that up with something else because um, my, you know, it just wasn't going to fly with my parents um, in my, that, you know, I feared that. And I also felt guilty because I had opportunities that others from my culture didn't have. And so I've always kind of peppered it with something. So in college, I did a major, I did a double major in studio art, and, uh, but I also had psychology as a major. And I wound up kind of doing more photography work. Um, and by the time I got to SVA, I wanted, I, you know, I had different jobs uh, in between. Uh, and then I wanted to play with a moving image. And the reason I applied to the program you guys were in was at the time, and I'm not sure if this is still true, it was the only program in the whole country that was a kind of a hybrid. It allowed you to have a photography background, but move into the moving image. It wasn't a film, traditional film school. And I like that. I like that ambiguity. I like the idea of being able to kind of, um, you know, explore and figure out my own, my own path. Um, so let me just share my screen so we can kind of start the more official part of it. And uh, let's see, there we go. So yeah, and in, you know, in, uh, I guess stepping out from SVA, I um, found myself um, to be an editor in a way. And I say found just because I remember Graham, who I think is on here, Weinberg, when I was doing my own video art, um, he was like, you know, you'd be a good editor. And I think that's partly because I get obsessive about little details. And I was like, are you kidding? Like, I would never do that. It's the worst job. <laughs> it's so tedious. Who would want to do that? Like, I was like, I hate doing that for myself. Why would I want to do that for someone else? And then fast forward, you know, a few years, and that's what I landed doing. And I was, you know, he was right. I was good at it because I did kind of hone in on these. And I had a lot of questions and I wanted to know why things work. But what I wanted to kind of talk to you about is the lessons that I've learned um, from jumping from video art to more commercial. And the first kind of three things that I was impacted by were um, that every single frame mattered. When you are doing commercial, even if it's a 15 second commercial, you know, it is still has an army or a mini army of directors, art directors, wardrobe, crews, and executives who will sit there and pour so much time over that 15 seconds and to just achieve a message, a goal that they think is going to further their agenda or something. Um, and the only way to move this process forward was to make a series of choices, right? I had to make choices as an editor, as well as um, everyone had to make a choice along the way to approve a, you know, a look, to approve the way that someone delivered a line. And it was just at first coming out of being like a one woman show, it was like, are you guys serious? This is ridiculous. Like we're spending so much time and money on a 15 second spot that I myself am not even going to watch when I go home. I will forward my own work because I wasn't into commercials. But it took me a while to realize that you know, as you started to make choices that maybe others didn't agree with, and then I had to defend them. And then you get more invested in your work, meaning like you have to understand why you needed to make that cut or why this made it, you know, 
was important. And uh, traditionally, I mean, things are changing up a little bit now, but you know, you would make a, um, you'd edit something and then you would submit or export something called an EDL or editor's decisions list. And in a way it was like a declaration, I thought that you're saying it's, you know, tells you the time code of exactly the ins and outs of what each um, take is, what scene, what part of the scene, and you've submitted to the color guy, he colorizes it, gives it back to you. And so it's, you're basically putting down on paper your final decisions. Um, and in that you're also learning about nuance. And so I think the thing I learned the most was just figuring out like, that it is really important to look at the detail because that is what makes up the whole. And it's something that when I was doing my own work, I kind of, I think, even though I thought I was pretty particular about it, it made it also, it made me understand that why every decision, everything is a choice. So, you know, when I teach editing, I've done editing workshops. I say any student, um, you know, we do more like hands-on. Um, you need to give me an answer for every decision you've made and every cut. There is no, I don't know, because every cut does have and does um, make a difference in the way I will perceive or someone else will perceive it. So that basically brought me to the idea of communication, right? And what is it that am I trying to say? And what is it that you guys are basically trying to say? And I think what I said earlier is the measure of your success is really just the ability to communicate clearly the vision that you have. Um, so I'm gonna just play, and I can talk over this one, it doesn't have um, audio. This is uh, Moy Bridge, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with. And it's one of the first kind of rudimentary um, images or moving images, right? And it's just a sequential sequence of photographs back to back. But in these even rudimentary kind of um, films, you kind of understand that there's, you know, film evokes an emotion and it evokes um, a feeling and you kind of imagine yourself there and you kind of um, are transported to somewhere else. And very soon people started to realize that. Um, I'm also gonna play this, which I think this is an excerpt actually, the much longer pieces on, um, on the other link, but to me, this is amazing because it's a film um, that was shot in 1901 in London and it's factory or laborers, like factory workers. Um, but it's, you know, one of the first instances that they saw a camera. It's been um, just as a, you know, in all honesty, it's been um, colorized and something called machine learning has been done to it by this uh, guy named Dennis, I'm not sure if I'm gonna say last name, right? Shiryav. Um, and basically that's all he, he really does. He's very into kind of taking old images and, and, and making them seem that they come to life. He hasn't altered it necessarily. It's more just the, if there's pixels missing, it fills it in and he's colorized it and upscaled it. But I just want you to look at it and just see how much emotion you can feel um, from, them looking at you, from them looking at us. Jesus, beautiful. So um, the longer piece, like I said, if you want is on the other link, you can watch it after. But what I found incredible about this was that I, you know, I've seen a lot of images in, in my life, but I was transported to something. And this idea that they were looking at me was more piercing than I think any kind of commercial film. It, you, I felt like it was almost a portal in time where I was looking at them, but I almost felt like they were looking at me. And this power of film early on, I think people started to realize that there is something about it. You know, people still this, to this day will call it the, you know, the magic of film. Um, in one of the other videos, there's, you know, Quentin Tarantino going on about how, you know, if it's less it's something is shot on film, it doesn't really matter. And, and to this day where, you know, people are, are transported and, um, and compelled to action because of film. So <laughs> in uh, kind of talking and thinking about, well, what is it that is this, this power of film, you know, that you can't escape the idea of propaganda. And so what's happened, you know, is soon after people realized the power of film, 
you have governments and uh, you know political uh, with political agendas decided to go ahead and um, use it to push their own agendas, right? So, you know, the definition of propaganda is basically information, and I was just reading this, especially of a biased or misleading nature used to promote or publicize a particular political cause or point of view. But in my opinion, it's also arguably one of the most efficient use of the medium. And I don't say that in just in film, I say, and, I'm, and I'm, I, I know I'm talking a lot about film today, but excuse me, I really want to kind of talk to the general use of image. Um, as you know, I'm not really sure how many of your pure photography students or collage and, or do both, but this is really, and all I'm talking about today, I think can apply to both. The idea of just this use of imagery, um, you know, and it was done very successfully during uh, Nazi Germany, uh, World War I, World War II, and even newsreels. And that was a propaganda pushed by the British government at the time. Um, because they had a stance that they wanted the America to have. So this idea of propaganda really birthed advertising, the idea of branding, and to me, even the idea of voice of in, in, in a way of being an artist, because it's a relentless rep repetition of a specific point of view, right? It's a relentless repetition of um, uh, ideas and emotions that you're trying to evoke. And I think in a lot of ways, that's what you know some artists do. Um, and I actually think that it kind of draws almost a clear line between, and I will a little bit later, between Hitler and Hitchcock, because they're, you know, the images and the kind of um, uh, attention to detail and the obsessiveness. Um, and because you're also thinking like, that this time there were very little, there's very little imagery out there. Um, and in general, both photo photography and a film. And so you're able to basically carry the audience by their hand and take them to where you wanted to, right? We're much more sophisticated now. And so the devices that people need to kind of either trick us or push us or make us believe about authenticity are very different. But at the time, uh, you know, it's, if, it, if it existed on film, it seemed true. And that's a very powerful thing to have had. Um, access to, and it's a very powerful thing to have the power to have when you, if you're a filmmaker and, or an image maker. This picture is by a woman named Lenny Reifenstahl, and she was um, an actress turned filmmaker. Um, and this is from a still from the movie Triumph of the Will, which is, I'm sure we've all seen images of, which is basically of Hitler, and it kind of portrays him in a godlike. Um, Godlike as a godlike figure, and this part of it here, this image, is basically a march that he had in a speech. And uh, you know, you look at it and you think it's fact. Well, if you dig a little further, you realize that this was all staged. There were bridges built for this. There were people paid to come down, and well, I don't know, paid, but told to come down. And so, uh, you know, she had access, unlimited access, and unlimited money to produce this propaganda film. And but. Are, you know, honestly, she's done a beautiful job. And that's, again, that's something else we could talk about, but this conflict of, of intention, ideal, and what, you know, and, and the message behind something. But she went on to do a film called Olympia um, as part of the 1936 Olympics that was held in Berlin. And part of kind of this image of the Aryan raised part of this idea of, you know, these godlike figures and it pushed that propaganda about um, you know, white supremacy in a way, but she also was able to do it in a very filmic and, um, or I should say, in a very uh, almost like Roman Greek. She she related her images a lot to um, images of the past that elicited, you know, in, um, feelings of either superiority or of of uh, civilizations, like great civilizations. Oops, sorry. So. Part of uh, this film Olympia, I think it took her two years to edit. And that's because she had, because they knew the Olympics was coming on, again, she had like over a hundred, I think, um, uh, film, uh, I guess, cinematographers. And she had them in every angle. They dug holes in the drenches. They, they were squeezing in, you know, between, um, uh, areas to just get the perfect shots. And so she had an enormous amount of footage to look through. 
the one thing I think she did successfully in Olympia is really kind of in a weird way evolve the audience in a very short amount of time from establishing shots, allowing you to understand what it is that you're viewing. And then at the same time conveying the feeling of what the athlete that she was kind of featuring or what that sport might've felt like doing it. And I think that's a very kind of interesting approach. Um, I've edited this down to about a minute. The full section of this is also on the other site. Um, but basically here's just some establishing shots she does. And then you'll see how she kind of ramps it up and wh where we end. So I'll just play this. So to me, what was interesting about that is that, you know, we start off and it's images of the pool, the wide shots you see, and, you know, just a regular kind of in real time, people diving. Then you get to seeing them ascend, right? And then you start to do the slow motion of how, um, let me just see if I can, yeah. You know, you're seeing slow motion and a bit more kind of beautiful shots of them. Um, here they're going to ascend. So you get to kind of see their point of view after a little bit. And as and you're seeing the crowd and you're seeing everyone else's, and now it just becomes kind of this beautiful feeling, right? They're kind of, you're getting to understand how they soar. And after a while, you know, you're shooting and, you're, and she's shooting them, but you almost get disoriented and you kind of almost feel like you're the diver, right? You're kind of like, I love this shot, but the shot is so amazing because that must, it might be what it feels like to kind of be in the air and float and not know which way is up. Um, and then at the end, we're not even seeing them land. We're not even seeing them go anywhere. It's basically, they're just diving. It's that freedom, right? We already know that there's a pool there. We already know what's happening. Um, and so you're just seeing these bodies fling themselves out into space. And instead of ending on water, she ends on scenes of the clouds, right? So it's kind of this, and in a very short amount of time for an audiences early on, I think it's amazing because she kind of pushes the audience from understanding like, okay, this is what you're watching. This is what's happening. But then these are the other things that can, you know, that the feelings and these are the emotions. And she was a master at that because that's how she was able to drive home um, very, you know, nefarious intent at times. But, you know, there is something to understanding why things work, no matter if they are, you know, agree with your agenda or not. Um, and weirdly enough, you know, she actually, um, her and I think uh, Hitler and others kind of fell out a little bit because there were other, you know, athletes at that Olympics, Jesse Owens being one of them who um, decimated his opponents basically. And she went to go photograph him. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure if this is pure fact or fiction, but it was said that uh, Hitler did not want her to do so. Um, but she did it anyway and created some, you know, one of the most iconic shots of him and also just of him running. And it became a bit of an issue because, you know, this is a woman who photographs like Nazi agenda. And here she is, she has a photograph of him. And I think he had a very interesting take on it. Um, and when he was asked and he was like, yeah, I wasn't invited to shake hands with Hitler, but I wasn't invited to the White House to shake hands with the president either. And so sometimes for the subject matter, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, you know, um, basically different points, people have different points of view from where, you know, where you're standing, where you're standing from in relation to 
um, the medium. Um, Lenny is also interesting because she kind of ties back to my to me a little bit in that after she went to do a lot of the films for Germany and Hitler, she kind of fell out and I think she decided to um, she went to Sudan, South Sudan, and she actually started photographing, you know, people, indigenous folks in Southern Sudan. So the complete opposite of this Aryan race, the complete opposite of everything that Hitler was preaching. Um, and she spent many years there uh, and did a number of books. And then she became controversial, controversial there as well because she had associations that she probably shouldn't have had with the North, which was where I'm from, which is the government. Um, so she's a very interesting figure because she kind of, you know, uh, and this is her with her um, very, I guess, well-endowed assistant. <laughs> But she was very controversial during her life um, and uh, still is after. So the reason I kind of, you know, talked about uh, Lenny, because I think she was, and not to give her any kind of shine or props in terms of her as a human being, but I think that if we are to break stuff down as language, and if we are to look at things as, um, you know, you have to understand what, how language is, is built and understand what the audience has seen and, and, and there, already has seen and kind of um, understands. And, you know, Lenny, I think was one kind of, she was early on. Another master of that is Hitchcock. Um, and he's just amazing in the fact that uh, he, when he thinks of film, and when he does a film, he puts everything down on paper in terms of storyboarding and he storyboards it to death. Now, you know, I'm not necessarily on that level of it and nor do I think that, you know, all films should be that way. I think that there's definitely a lot of, um, you know, directors and amazing filmmakers that um, improvise and allow their actors more freedom. But the one thing that by doing so, I think what Hitchcock did is he built a visual language. And part of the reason why he, uh, was successful at building visual languages because when he started, he started during the um, silent film era. So he had to figure out a way to communicate without sound. And so his visuals really became key and he wanted to kind of uh, push through just the limitations of the image. In the, in the other link, I think I have one that's kind of titled The Language of Hitchcock. Here, I'm just gonna play a couple of uh, pieces of what he, he, how he talks about it. And one of the biggest things to just preface this is that he talks about wanting to break the, from the cliche. So he was very aware of language, but also didn't want to repeat language, a visual language, I should say, um, because he wanted to exp push the audience to experience things differently. So this is just a specific little. avoiding the cliche, but that seems to be the one thing uh, that obsesses me uh, in, uh, in making a picture is trying, not always succeeding, but trying to avoid the cliche. I mean, uh, I remember when I made that movie, North by Northwest, we did a journey from New York to Chicago the 20th century, century limited and I'd always noticed in all pictures concerning trains and why they would do it I have the faintest idea the north by northwest, I went to the end of the corridor of the traveling train and opened the top half of the iron door and had a special rack made and let the camera slide out and let it see the curve of the train. So I didn't take the camera off the train to have a look at it from a distance. Okay. So he's just kind of talking about point of view, right? Um, and how to kind of allow, allow people to uh, 
be there. This is him talking about um, the famous shower scene in Psycho. Let me try that again. Hold on. There's a process of making film a cinematic approach to this, to, to its basic. The, the picture psycho contains quite an amount of cinematic approach to this, to, to its basic content. In the first place, we had in it the murder of a woman in a shower, of a new woman. Now, as you know, you could not take the camera and just show a new woman being stabbed to death. It had to be done impressionistically. So it was done with little pieces. The head, the feet, the hand, the parts of the torso, shadow and curtain, everything you see the shower itself. I think in that scene there were 78 pieces of film in about 45 seconds. Um, and again, on the other site I have, if you want to look at uh, the full um, segment and you can kind of see the shower scene in case you haven't seen it, but I assume most people have, so I didn't put it here. Um, and then lastly, is this is kind of, will take us into, um, of why things work. It's just a little a fun quote by him about, you know, how you should think about making things. Crime, whichever way you um, commit it, um, whether it's a murder, theft, kidnapping, what have you, you're faced with that. The question is, it's like writing a scene where you say, man comes through the door. But the big question is, how? <laughs> um, and I think that's kind of where we all are, right? Is that everything has, you can say everything has been done. You can say that every experience, you know, or things have been done, but it's the how. And I think that's what I want to encourage you guys to think about because it is your point of view, your particular way that you view things that really is going to be the how. Um, and your connection to and your ability to make your view crystal clear is gonna be the differentiator. Um, and because we are in a generation, we are in a, in a time where it is all about the you know I, right? It's I, I, I. And there's a lot of eyes <laughs> out there. <laughs> so it's a situation of, you know, how do you, how do you kind of, um, or what is it about your perspective um, that is unique? But it's not really a challenge the way I think people try to make it in terms of, um, oh, I must differentiate myself. I think it's, again, it's really more connection to your yourself um, and your uh, vision. So. I wanted to just kind of, I'm gonna go through these a little bit, you know, quickly, but I think they've raised some really good questions about how to think about work. So there's um, an editor by the name of Walter Murch. You know, he, he knows some things. He's done the Godfather trilogy. He's done Apocalypse Now. So the man, you know, he's, he's kind of okay. Um, no, but he's amazing. And he came up with something he called the six, the rule of six. And he basically breaks down um, the six most important things in making a, um, a film. And I think this goes though for installations. I think this is um, in terms of any series that you make, whether it's photographic or filmic. Um, and the first rule that he says is emotion. And he says that's about 51%. And emotion really is the driving force of everything, right? It's why you you know what how something makes you feel it's the vibe it's what is it that you're kind of um put, putting the audience through in a way and everything else has to support emotion all your choices have to support emotion meaning if the other things that you're doing don't support that same um idea or aren't at the at the heart of this emotion that you're trying to convey then get rid of them because this is really the most important part 
of all of, of everything you're doing is how it feels, how it makes you feel, how it makes the audience feel and the experience. It's really all about experience. And again, I mean this across the board, photography, installation, video, commercial film, everything. Uh, and the second is story, right? That's about 23%. So it's about half as important. And I agree with that in that I think, yes, a good story is obviously important, but if it doesn't make you feel anything, if it's, it's the way it's, you know, there's some people who can tell you about their day about going to go get coffee and it's hilarious. And it's because of the way that they make you feel about it. It's the way that they tell the story versus the, you know, the plot points, right? And there's, you know, a difference between a story and a plot. A story is basically, the, you know, the overall idea of what happens, you know, and then the plot is this happens first, this happens second, this happens third. But again, the story has to support the emotion. Um, the third is rhythm. And rhythm, I mean, there is no really kind of, rhythm is just supports again, the emotion. If it's frenetic, if it's something that is, um, you know, um, s slow and smooth and, and, and gives you time. It's really all, of, there's a reason for it. There's decisions that you make about that to help support the other, the story and the emotion that you need to convey. Um, I trace. So I trace, I think for people who are doing any kind of serial work, any kind of um, installation work is very important. I trace really here means, you know, you look at and see what are the things within a frame that captivate someone's eye and what is motivating them from one thing to the next. Um, and you kind of also realize that at the actual eye is something that people are attracted to. But within that, it's also good to see like, where does the eye go as it moves through your frame? So if you're doing an installation, let's say, if you're doing a multi-channel video, it's important to understand and how someone is receiving that. It's important to know what the room is gonna look like, the lighting, um, the height it's gonna be. It's gonna important to understand the sound and what comes first and what's after. It's important to understand like, the relationship, how close are they, are the monitors, or how close are they in relation? The same with photographs. If you're doing a, a show, how close are you hanging these things? If you're doing a book, what's the relationship? Because that is all I trace. And that's the one thing I've learned in terms of like having more of a hybrid background is to kind of take things that, you know, a lot of times people categorize in one um, medium, but at the end of the day, we're all communicators, right? We're trying to communicate. So I, look at these rules and I, I open it up to anything I do because I think it is important. Um, and when you think of audience and you think of how they experience your work, it's very important to understand what their experience is gonna be um, to, your, to your work. Now, whether it's something that you want to you know, have uh, people experience intimately or it's not as important for them to understand but more about for you to, um, you know, in a way expel something or an idea that's very private and personal, that's fine too. But at least you have to understand how they're relating to your work and why people are reacting to it the way they are. The next two are not as important in terms of both the way he um, has them listed, but also um, they're really kind of, I think with, as people's visual language got more sophisticated, um, it's not as, so he talks about 2D space and 3D space. And these are really about um, the way that like not breaking the 180 rule and the idea that, um, you know, like if you shouldn't have an angle at this, a camera set up at this angle, but then at this angle, I don't, that's not as important to me right now. I think that's also with people have kind of moved beyond that and broke it, but it is good to understand, um, I guess the juxtaposition of space, how you juxtaposition things from different um, space. Sorry guys, hold on, let me tell, tell these guys. Sorry about that. <laughs> COVID. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, so I, I wanted to kind of um, bring those, you know, six rules up I mean, rules is a you know, funny word, right? So, you know, it kind of means to be broken. So it's not really a rule, but it's more things to be conscious of as you move on, as you do your work, as you, um, you know, set up experience for, experiences for people. It's really important to um, just think about everything. Think about the nuance. 
because at the end of the day, that's, I think, how I measure the success. I don't measure it anymore by what others think in terms of, um, oh, they, you know, a critic. I measure it by, is it as close to what I've imagined as possible? It is, is it as close to kind of having that feeling that I wanted to have? And, and you know, I mean, to, to be honest, like, you know, art is a very interesting thing, you know, in some ways it's uh, therapeutic, some ways it's methodical, some ways it's complete free form, in some ways it's possession, you know, sometimes you literally are possessed to do something you don't, and you're just working and then you look back and you're like, oh, wow. Um, you know, and it, and it, at, those are the moments where that kind of this innate training, this idea of thinking about all these different things kind of crystallizes and it, it comes to life. It's kind of like athletes that train. And the reason why a lot of athletes train rigorously over and over is because they're retraining their nature right, to react a specific way so that when they don't have time to think, when they are getting a pass or when they're doing that, that that kind of retraining, that's what kicks in. And I think that's kind of the same with this is that, you know, the more you just kind of look at your own work and others and understand why things work and even with the work you've made, like if you like something that you've done, why did it work? Why is it this is something that I feel like is successful to me? Um, I think that kind of innately helps you make better work in the future. Uh, this is Andrew Dawson and I picked him because I've worked with him in the past, but also he started off as a photographer and um, he, you know, moved on to do film and he did a film called Mother of George, which is visually absolutely stunning. Um, and it's stunning because it is from an eye of a photographer, but also he really um, thought about just um, the kind of color and, um, you know, just the emotion that things evoke. And it's a very, if you look at the film, I mean, it takes place in an apartment, you know, in some New York City streets in a shop and very, so it's, it's very like kind of minimal backgrounds and very mundane situations, but it's absolutely gorgeous for a lot of different reasons. It's also shot by uh, Bradford Young, who's, um, you know, I'll, I'm going to have an excerpt from him later, but I'm just going to show you Andrew talking about the film and just so you can see some of the visuals of it. Hello, my name is Andrew Dosimo. I'm the director of Mother of George. This scene is the first time we're going to focus with a lead actress um, played by Dina Ferreira. And I wanted the audience to, for the first time, really see her face after the big wedding. And the music um, is by Strauss um, for last songs. And I chose that because I wanted the audience to relate to her and not necessarily separate themselves and think, oh, this is a, a different culture, a different place. Uh, the colors were very influenced by really um, a lot of paintings that from the bicentennial era. A lot of, uh, there's all these paintings of Africans in the bicentennial era. And I, really wanted to do this. I really wanted to depict the lushness, the, the metallicness, the, the silver that's constantly flickering in those paintings. This leads into the next scene where she and her mother in law, played by Ruki Ajayi, a veteran Nigerian actress. And our mother, played by Angela Kijo, sitting down with her the wedding night and really advising her on how to keep a household and what is expected of her as a wife. Go on, put it on the list. And I really wanted us to really. Um, focus on the scene in the sense that I did, I did not want to make it a uh, sort of a intercut portrait. I really just wanted to create one plate so we can see what's going on in that scene rather than editing it from one person's dialogue to the other. Um, how can I use all the elements of film to evoke the emotion, which is the lighting, the panning of the camera, the fact that she's suddenly seen so you, you begin to imagine what she's going through as well. Um, 
the reflection on my face, the light reflection, uh, the joy and sadness of that moment. I really just wanted to create that place that this is all that. George, my back to day, my love. That was um, Andrew talking. And then this is Bradford Young. He's actually um, the cinematographer that shot that um, film. And he's also done Selma. He also just did um, The Arrival. Well, not just actually, but that was, um, he was nominated for um, an Academy Award in 2017. And he's a, I mean, relatively new. I mean, probably like past five to seven years, um, just talking about how he perceives, you know, um, working in the industry. The only thing I can, the only advice I can offer to any filmmaker, image maker, artist is that um, having knowledge of self, knowing who you are and where you come from, is the is the the most important tool you have. It's more important than the camera. It's more important than the script. It's more important than the sound design. It's more important than the editing because all of those elements are informed by your accent. So before you, before you invest in the camera, before you invest in writing the script, ask yourself those serious questions about who you are and the stories that you want to tell. If you don't see yourself in the story, if the story is not a reflection of a world that you want to create, it's probably not a story worth telling. That's just me, that's just my own bias in terms of why I feel like filmmaking is an important art form, why it's an important expression, because it gives us another ability like, like music uh, like painting, like sculpture, um, to to shroud and, 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 and give the world an interpretation of the world, the future, the world, an imagination of the world that we want. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm gonna end it with um, another young man who's up and coming, whose work I adore. He's also a photographer, but a uh, painter. He also does uh, video art. Um, his name is uh, Jim Chuchu. He's uh, uh, Kenyan. He has some really amazing photographs. Um, and he's here talking about, um, this was a TEDx that he did um, and they were, he was asked about, um, you know, or he was kind of making the, the, the uh, observation that regardless of where he goes around the world, you know, people look at him like, you know, you're up and coming, things are happening for you. Why are you basically still uh, based in Kenya and not somewhere else? Being in Kenya, being in Nairobi. And every time I travel to uh, other countries, it fails with these, invariably I hear the question, so where are you based? And the answer is always no. And sometimes I get the sense that people asking me that question are disappointed in the answer. Like maybe I'm not taking my art career seriously because I'm staying in Nairobi, which is a cultural wasteland by, by global standards. And we miss out on all these things like residences and all these opportunities that happen. Um, and it is odd for us that even now, it's very hard to find African art in Africa. It's much easier to come across an African film in a festival in Europe or in New York, and that's strange. So there are definitely disadvantages, but we continue to choose to stay in Nairobi because every time we make work in Nairobi, the city shifts, uh, the country shifts, uh, the kids are watching what we do, and they expand the imagination of what it is to be Kenyan, and to be Black, and to be African. And people find a voice in the world, and they hear a word or a feeling they've had, but not had the exact word to say what it was. And I think that's a really amazing thing. Like when you look at where we started, even with the lecture and film, and the idea that you know cinema and film and images are just basically a sequential uh, sequence of images, still has the power to shift people. Right in the beginning, it was from just the idea of understanding, um, you know, this new medium, and 
it's still changing how we perceive ourselves. It's still changing how we perceive each other. You know, it's been a turbulent few, four years, and it's still kind of, I mean, if there's ever been a testament to that, it's been the last four years of how information, media, propaganda, images of what is seen and what is not, what is omitted um, is truly affects people and it really affects people's lives. Um, and I, I, you know, um, I thank Charlie for giving me the opportunity because uh, we had an exchange, you know, during this, I think it was a summer earlier last year. Um, and it was about just this idea of inclusion and something that I kind of wanted to repeat, if I may, was that, you know, people have always existed, right? People of all backgrounds, of all color, we have always been here. We've always helped build. And no matter where you are from, if you're from what is considered the center or from the outside, um, your contributions have always been here. I mean, we measure civilization, right, by its art. When we look back and we look at the ancient times, that's what we measure it by. And when you look at ancient times, you look at the Egyptians, you look at Asian arts, you look at these and you say, oh, wow, they're so advanced for their time. And yet people from those backgrounds are not as appreciated now. And a lot of times excluded. So I think part of the conversation to be had for the future is no one's asking you to allow me in. I've been here. No one's asking you to open up or give, you know, a handout. I've been working. I've been here. We've all have. It's more about allowing that voice and allowing the focus. But now I think with technology and the ability to really make images and, and really have impact and not necessarily need as, re, as of right now, power brokers. I mean, they still exist, but, and it might be shut down soon, but as of right now, you as image makers from everywhere really kind of um, understand that power you have um, and understand that you have a great ability to um, engage, to compel, to do nothing but have people sometimes enjoy themselves. It could be something funny. Not everything has to be serious, but it is a gift and it is a power that you have. Um, and it's basically just understanding how to use that and understanding how to access that. Uh, Bradford Young mentions it in his um, little uh, blurb or little excerpt when he says, you know, learn what your accent is. And I love that approach, meaning it's kind of, it's exactly kind of what we're talking about, right? With visual language. It's like you understand how to speak, but now you have to understand what your dialect is or what your accent and the best way uh, for you to access that. So use the time you have now with everyone around you to figure out what is and push yourself and ask people to push you. Um, but, you know, I'll end with the first critique I had after coming to SVA, at that point I was doing collage work, was with um, Raghavir Singh, who's unfortunately not with us anymore. And he was more of a traditional uh, photographer. And I remember I showed him my collage work and he was like, what are you doing here? He said, why are you in this program? And I was taken aback and he was dead serious. And he was like, I don't understand why you're here. This is a photography you know, um, uh, school, et cetera, program. And even though I went to lunch with a friend um, and I was kind of like, or someone I just met that became a friend and I was kind of like, what am I doing here? But what it did actually was it pushed me further into what I wanted to do, which is it made me think like, yeah, I didn't come back to do photo. What I really wanted was to push the moving image. And I, it forced me to understand who I was and why I wanted to be there and to kind of prove that um, you know, this is just as valid. And it was one of those things where it actually allowed me to look at myself in a way that I think really pushed me and helped me because it made me understand like, oh my God, I didn't even see that the fact that I was doing collage was my own way of trying to get to the moving image. It was my own way of kind of layering and trying to add context and juxtapose things. Um, and then I just jumped and that's what I, you know, I did from that point on. So I say use this time wisely um, and good luck to everyone. And I'm so excited to kind of um, hopefully meet some of you uh, for our individual one-on-ones. Wow, thank you. Oh, thank you.
My goodness. Uh, it's curious you brought up uh, Raghavir Singh because I just talked about him in a class yesterday. And oh, wonderful yeah. photographer, amazing colorist and documenter of his cult own culture, but terribly, terribly rigid about what he thought photography was. And yeah. uh, your reaction is not uncommon to many things that he talked about, but uh, he had his own discipline and his own, <laughs> his own accent, as you would say. And uh, it's funny how something uh, in opposition pushes you to where you want to go. Yeah. And uh, uh, I think we should open this up to questions if you're willing. And um, I'm sure there are a lot of questions. It was a wonderful presentation. And I just thank you so much. And uh, Thank you. Yeah, so if anyone has any questions, feel free or comments or whatever's I'll take. Come on, folks. Can I start a question? Sure. Everybody knows I always have tons of questions. <laughs> I am really curious about, I loved watching the, I don't remember the art of the um, editor or artist name that did the, um, the vintage film that they colorized and reproduced um, or cleaned up. But the question I had about that film when I was watching the, the long excerpt that you, that you sent me earlier, I'm curious, does anyone know what they were looking at? I assumed it was a camera lens. And because when you watch a lot of that material, they're really staring at something and I could only assume it was a lens and I don't know what the camera looked at, looked like. Um, it did, I did get the reaction that you were asking about, you know, us looking at them, looking at us. And I, I did have that feeling, but I was wondering what it was like for them to be on the street and they looked at this, whether it's a box or a lens or a contraption because they would stare at it for quite a while. I mean, there's some children in there that were really staring at it for quite a while. Right. Now, that's a great question. I mean, as far as I know, it was just the camera. Um, and I mean, this was 1901, so it was very early on. And I'm not really sure. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming the camera is much larger. They had plates that they had to expose. And, um, but I don't, you know, I don't know if there was anything else outside of that. Um, I also think that they were probably explaining. There's a few moments, and I've watched some of the other things that he, um, that he uh, cleaned up, where you see people kind of interact. And, and even when that uh, longer piece, there's like a worker, and it's almost like he's saying, and I'm not sure if they're saying like, oh, we're taking photographs, or if people are asking. But um, I think the the more work that you look at from that time, you really kind of start to see people just like, what is that? Um, and I'm not sure if there was a crew or not, but those are great questions. I don't know the exact answer, but I, I, as far as I know, I don't think there's much more than that, but yeah. I have a question. Oh. Um, how did you decide to transition into editing considering it didn't start out being your favorite thing? <laughs> Um, I don't even, I guess it was more because, let me try to remember exactly. Well, initially, you know, again, this was over 20 years ago. So when I learned editing, we were doing it, I think it was like a tape to tape. It was like a three quarter to three quarter was the first machine that we had at SBA and then Media 100. And so I had to kind of, and I realized that, oh, cause I had done more graphic stuff as well that I was able to do it more so than other people, maybe just because as, they, as it transitioned and even like the two years I was there, it transitioned into um, digital at that point. And, um, and I had a friend, uh, Sandra Dillon, who also was you know, at MFA um, and she eventually moved on to doing advertising. And I'm trying to remember the sequence of events, but I think basically what it was, was that um, I had started to work in editing um, but more as like part of visual um, world. I was working at a um, internet, what was it called? It was called Sapient, which is still going on now. I mean, it's still a great company now, but 
I was doing more of just kind of like their internal communications, a lot of design stuff. But then if they needed video, they were like, oh, she knows how to do that thing. So I would just kind of do it every once in a while. And then my friend Sandra gave me a call and was like, oh, there's an assistant editor position. Do you want to do it? And I was like, I have an MFA. Why would I go do be an assistant editor? But then I kind of went and I saw um, what it was. And I, I was like, wow, this is really interesting. I mean, it was a lot of work, but I, it's weird. I mean, I'm a reluctant editor. And I say that because I've, all, in the last few years, uh, 20 years, I have said at times, I'm not going to do this again. Um, and I'm going to shift and I'm going to do something else, but I keep coming back to it. So I still have that kind of weird relationship with it. Um, I know I'm good at it. I know I like it, but it is, it's very draining. Um, and I think when you're working on something that is great or that's in interesting or fun, it's amazing. But when you're working on something that isn't so amazing, it still is draining. And that's the hard part. It's like, you're basically polishing a turd, right? Is the expression. And you're just like, I have to do that. Like <laughs> I have no choice, but you know, to do that. So it is one of those love hate relationships for me. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Thank you. I say, can I say one thing about this in, in reference to Sarah? This is Graham. I'm not putting my face on the screen. Okay. Uh, there, there, are, uh, um, there are always a few people in the class who have this real talent. A, a kind, it's a kind of a musical talent. And there, there, there aren't that many. And I've been watching this over the years. And Sarah was one of the ones who stood out at this. I mean, you know, I, I'm a, I've worked as an editor for years. It's not something that one loves to do, but the fact that, you know, one can do it gives one satisfaction. That's all I can say. But I, I do remember that Sarah stood out as, as kind of having this talent noticeably, mm -hmm. even before she really started to edit. It has something to do with a kind of a musical sensibility, I would say, anyway. You know what, you're right, actually, because as I've met more editors, a lot of editors actually um, play some instrument. I play percussion, like hand percussions. And because if, you know, if you look back at the different six rules, rhythm is really an important part of it, understanding pace and rhythm. Um, and so I think that that, that is um, something that if you are inclined, if any of you are inclined, try it. It might be something that you might be into, just understanding like just um, how the space, right? Because a space in between things is just as important as what's on the screen. Um, so I'm just curious if I can ask you guys a question. Let me see if I can get a grid, bigger grid view of how many of you um, are experimenting with the moving image. Okay. So mm, is it 50-50 or less than 50-50, right? Something like that? How many of you think you're going to continue with the moving image? Oh, even less. How many of you are doing any installation in terms of photography, any serial kind of work? Or is it more just like, um, are you thinking of like, I'm curious as just what kind of work everyone is kind of doing in terms of the still image? Maybe Randy or someone can jump in just. Adam, are you here? Can you um, kind of give us an overview? Adam's been looking at or talking to a lot of the thesis students, not necessarily the first years, and kind of giving us a breakdown of what um, kind of media that everyone's working in, because <clears throat> it's usually still photographs or it's installation or it's video or it's a combination of all of that. So it's always interesting every year to, to, to see what the breakdown is. Uh, we usually have all of those uh, kinds of projects but from year to year, it can change. So Adam and maybe Seth, I don't know what you're yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot, there are a lot of students are doing video, uh, whether or not it's they're making a documentary or a feature film or little shorts that they're putting together. Um, I mean, pretty much every student does video at some point coming through the right. program, which I think is really great. Um, and I think a lot of people incorporate it somehow into their project whether or not it's performance-based or they're making a short film. Um, so I would say the, the hands that we saw up are not necessarily that scientific an indication. And that at least among the thesis students, I would say more than half are doing some kind of video. 
the, the one, one other thing I might actually ask Charlie is, um, Sarah, this might be different from when you were a student, but when I first started working at SVA, which was just, just after you left, um, there really kind of was, and maybe Graham can talk to this a little too, there really was two camps, a camp of video or moving image and a camp of photographers, traditional photographers, and not so much in installation-based work. I don't think it was quite as popular um, in the art world at the time, maybe. But all of a sudden, I think, and I don't know what, this is what I need to ask Charlie, is that there was a time not that long ago, maybe it was five or 10 years ago, where all of a sudden the photographers really had to learn video. It just was a given that they probably did it already in their lives with our smartphones, but that for a photographer not to know video or moving images um, was gonna be a real um, detriment to, what their, to their skills and to their knowledge of the moving of the, of the image. Same thing sort of happened too, in my opinion, with the, the anyone who was working in video or film also had to learn about the still because they were quite um, unknowledgeable about a still image, a one image. So I don't know if Charlie or Graham want to talk about that a little bit. I, I would address it. One thing happened for sure is the technology of the camera itself simply made both possible and, and uh, facilitated both practices in a rather remarkable way. And certainly as a photographer, you really don't have a future unless you know video in the sense that if you're gonna do commercial work or you know for higher work, almost everybody wants both. And from the filmmaking or video making point of view, uh, I, I referenced Nestor Alamedros yesterday, great, editor uh, and, and director of photography, rather, uh, who said he learned everything from Andre Cortez because he thought composition was something, how the frame directed what he did. Uh, and I think that's what video and filmmakers learn from photography, learning, you know, just that you, you are using a frame, though how we use that frame in both mediums is very different. Uh, if nothing else, certainly the installation processes really came about when, again, the technology allowed for very easy projection in space, you know, in any kind of spaces or the moving image to and combine with other digital forms as well as the still image on a monitor or whatever became a practice. Uh, in that same period, because the technology facilitated. Though people like Graham, and he can speak to this, were doing installations with video, you know, well before that. In fact, when I first met Graham, you know, I saw his work as really a, a, a interactive video installation artist. Um, and lastly, to address the question and to, for the student's sake, there's no way you can properly represent yourself, what you did as an artist, moving or still, without making some kind of reproduction of it or for a, disseminating your work into the real world through the network. So if you're an installation artist, you better know how to make that video to document what you did. and vice versa, you need also to know how to make a proper still of what you did, whether you are a you know, video artist, a uh, still artist, or whether you're just making something for reproduction in a magazine or online for promotion. So you really do have to know all of it, <laughs> I think, in terms of the lens and, and screen arts and still and moving. Graham, you wanna address any of that? See there. Uh, let me, yes. Uh, I just want to say that um, I'm, I'm kind of ashamed that we have to admit this, but I think a lot of what we do is driven by the technology. When the tech, and, and that was kind of underlying something that Charlie just said. When the projectors became easily available, many students started using projectors because they, they, there was so much you could do with projectors. When suddenly you could you know, the, the still camera that you were using could make very high qualities 
a, a TV quality or film quality videos, everybody, of course, picked those up and started doing that. So the, the technologies that we use, I, I mean, I'm talking about this kind of uh, looking at SVA for being in this department for over 25 years. Just as a kind of, of overview, you can see that as the technology came along, students started to use it because it was there and then they had to adapt their skills to learn it, which is of course what we, we try to do. But on the other hand, there are, in each of these fields, there are specific talents that different people bring to it, kind of inbuilt talents. I mean, as I said, Sarah and a, a number of other people over the years was naturally an editor. Other people are naturally cinematographers. Others are naturally photographers. So there's on the one hand, there's the technology and there's, then there's what you kind of naturally bring to it. Others are storytellers. We have all types and ev everybody tries to do all of the things, but I think there's always one talent that kind of leads that leads your work. And I see it all the time in students. This is a student who can tell stories and everything that they do is gonna be around their storytelling. Anyway, that's kind of my little contribution to this. One more thing. I just wanna go back to Sarah, what, how she opened it up about editing. Uh, basically, I think you said everything, every detail counts, every gesture, every frame counts. And, um, the basic issues of editing are there for both, both forms of lens arts, the still and the moving. I mean, one of the problems I think that the graduate students tackle is learning properly how to edit their work, what to leave out, what to put in, uh, what represents something else that was wonderful but doesn't belong in the sequence or in the body of work. And, uh, you know, a great body of, of photographs or of any, any artist is really a sequence of work that leads into a new body of work. And it's all about editing. It's all about leave, what to leave out, what to put in, when to cut it, <laughs> how many is too much, um, whatever. And uh, uh, those, that issue of every, every frame counts in terms of whether it belongs or doesn't belong is, is in both forms. And thank you for saying that, Sarah, because I think it, I, I would never be an editor or film editor. I have no patience and I, I, it, I find it daunting, but I do know what it is to edit. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to definitely say that you're, yeah, that you definitely are our editor. And I think what's funny to me is there's an expression that I, you know, when I first heard it, it's used mostly in editing, but I think it can be applied to everything, which is kill your baby. It's horrible, but it's called kill your babies. <laughs> With that, is that all the time. <laughs> you know, which is basically, you know, matter it, in some ways, like there's a reason why traditionally there were roles that, you know, now that technology has blurred, um, were certain roles, meaning the maker, the editor. Um, and because sometimes when you make something and you know how much effort you put into it, it kind of ties you to feeling like you have to use it or you think it has to be in something where when someone else comes along and they haven't been in the process or don't care, they can say, well, this just doesn't work. And you're like, but it took me forever. Or it took me like half the budget was on this, or I was, you know, this is the one shot I was setting up and all the others I did in like five minutes, but, it, and it's like, well, it just doesn't make sense. Um, and so I think the hard part is when you're both, right? When you are your own um, visual maker and then no matter what you're doing, if you're a photographer or, or a moving image and also being the editor or knowing how to and when to kind of leave things out because you have to almost separate like what well, after you've made it is this kind of, again, back to your aligning yourself with your own vision. Does this make sense for what you wanna say? Um, but if not, like they say, you might have to kill your babies and you just keep them for the next time, right? You keep it and maybe that like, it'll spark something else, but yeah. How about some questions from the students? Anybody want to raise an issue or challenge anything or just want to know how Sarah did it? <laughs> uh, I, I have a question. Good. Sure. Um, so, uh, like, 
I'm I'm pr- I'm pretty sure that your thesis project was uh, related to moving image. It was a firm. Yes. Okay. So, so now that we are not, you know, like able to attend school in person and right, we're not right. like able to see other people's reactions right. on what the video is. Right. How do you take like for for us basically? How do we take our video projects forward with? the ongoing situation how do we you know like let the world know about it or how do we how do we make it in a time like this as moving image makers right that's a great question and i didn't even address that um and sorry for not really thinking about that thoroughly because you're right we're in a very strange place right now um and everyone is i want you to know everybody is people on movie sets, people on commercial sets, you know, my life paused for a while because we don't know what to do. There's a few projects that I'm working on that I'm supposed to shoot interviews that we're also now having to think about like, well, what does that look like? How are we going to do that when I can't really be, I can't travel one to from one person to the next to the next. It's going to take months just to kind of do the two week and that tests and all that as well as, and then, you know, visually, what does that look like? Um, and I mean, the only thing I can say is I don't have a clear answer except to say, well, then this, you have to kind of look at this as your, well, there's two things you're asking. One is how to make the work. And then two is how to have people experience it. Right. So how to make the work, I think is a, is a creative challenge of figuring out, like, for example, for one of the projects that I was doing, which was supposed to be interviews, what I've come to do is now I'm going to use voice. So I'm going to have really clear recordings so I can trust audio but the video, I might have to do Zoom calls or have them shoot some things just to have a reference. And then I'm going to you know, either overlay with found footage or ask them to submit photographs or um, you know, previously shot video or something like that. And so the feel might change, but at least some of the messaging in terms of um, what is said won't. Uh, graphics is another way to try around that. Um, but there's a lot of challenges. I mean, the other thing is you can change the point of view, right? So if your point of view with someone initially, like for me, again, if it was going to be an interview that I was going to give um, with someone, you know, perhaps they talk to someone that they are familiar with. So we had a, a short film that was supposed to be just a conversation, but it became a short film that was in the New York African Film Festival um, in December. And we were supposed to interview this woman, she's a Sudanese woman who was basically critical in helping, there was a big revolution in Sudan last year and she became like the CNN for the diaspora because she was reporting things but also translating them and just letting us know what was happening. There was a big uh, internet blackout for months and you know I had family affected and, and, and injured and we just didn't know but she helped by her Instagram stories, she basically helped kind of um, connect us to um, our homeland. And Initially, we were going to interview her and I had all these, you know, amazing shots. And then, you know, we realized there's this COVID is just not going anywhere. So um, I asked her brother to interview her and we were lucky because he actually was someone who was a professional interviewer. But at the same time, even if he wasn't, it made us kind of think about the idea of in these tight spaces that you're in now, think about the point of view differently. So it could be that someone close to them and might give you, and it actually turned out better than if I were or someone else interviewed her because there was a natural relationship there. Um, and, you know, someone she trusted and it was, you know, at a park, everything had to be outside because again, the cameraman had to be there and um, a sound person. And I was calling them on FaceTime um, and watching the shot and just kind of say, okay, I'll check in in a little bit. So you have to let could get control. I mean, it wasn't the shots I would have wanted, et cetera, but it's okay. Cause it's sometimes the message and then what we were saying before the emotion is what's important. So I would say that I, you know, I feel for you guys because I, you know, it's weird. I honestly just didn't even think about that way, but yeah, you are in a really effed up situation in terms of your um, ability to interact with some subject matter, right? In photography and video. But, you know, at times all I can say is sometimes, you know, the best things come out of con- uh, the tightest, uh, you know, constriction in a way. And you might have to push yourself in a way of thinking about things differently. So shift the lens, shift it, whether it's point of view, shift it, whether it's who the real storyteller is, shift it, whether you turn it on the camera on yourself, if you were doing to turn it on other people. 
if it's written text, someone gives it to you and you, you know, type it on. If it's voice instead of just imagery, um, you know, if it's abstract, if it's nature, it becomes landscape, whatever you can figure out a way around your um, situation, do that. In terms of how to get it seen, um, again, I don't know. I don't know in terms of, you know, when the world opens up and hopefully it's soon, but I personally, I think it's gonna be at least about another year, but since we're really open up, but when it opens up, there's gonna be, I think a huge appetite for um, interaction, right? Huge appetite for arts, huge appetite to, be go, to go out and experience things in person. So I would also think, think about that, meaning that your work might not be something that it's experienced the way you want it to be now, but it is something to think about when the world does open up and think about the spaces that it can live in that maybe before people wouldn't have appreciated um, and think about you know, where else it can be. Um, film festivals have now all shifted to the online platform. And I actually wonder if some of them will go back just because financially have they probably been like, wait a minute, we can still kind of make some money and not you know, spend it. But I miss, you know, for, us, for a filmmaker, you wanna meet people, you want the, that exposure, you want to, you know, be in a room with someone you would have never been in the room with um, and have a random conversation because otherwise it's, you know, you're, there's still this barrier. But, um, you know, right now online is the, is the main platform that people are pushing. Um, but I would say, think about what, you know, what that might look like in a few months and, and maybe prep for that. Um, but yeah, I, I do feel for you guys. It's a, it's a really tough time, really tough time. I just want to cite another example of adapting. Um, I think we've mentioned Dina Latowski a number of times over the last two years, who's a, another alum, uh, graduated, I guess, eight years ago. I don't know, seven years ago. I can't remember. But she's a freelance photo editorial photographer and one of the best around. And she got an assignment from the New York Times to do some portraits. And she simply did them off the screen, but she directed the person being photographed from the screen, how to pose, what to put behind them, how to light themselves, all those things. And they're beautiful portraits that they were actually photographed from the screen itself. And, uh, or, or she ca image ca uh, screen captured. I'm not sure exactly how she did it, but you have to adapt. And that may be a form of doing portraits. So, you know, you, you don't have to travel to so-and-so to, <laughs> to take the portrait of the person, but you, you art direct it, if you will, or you, okay. you edit it. Um, so that, that look at Dina Latowski, New York Times, uh, uh, screen portraits. Um, other questions? Yeah, I have a question. So since we talk about like working through the cyberspace and art and technology, mm -hmm. you know, like, like with the development of technology, like now we have a lot of you know, new media to, <laughs> yes. to work to work on. So like yeah. VR, AR, and recently I heard about blockchain art, the crypto art, which is very new. So, you know, I just sometimes I feel like really overwhelming about like all this new technology. Right. Uh, I feel like, so like as artists, like are we responsible to, you know, follow the development of the technology? Since, you know, cause like there are just like so many new medias that we can work on. I feel like because other people work on that, it looks really, you know, fabulous and interesting. <laughs> so I feel like, oh, I should, I should, you know, also learn something about that. But like, you know, there are just like too many informations. Yeah, sometimes. I think, yeah, and I completely agree with you. I feel like that about life in general right now. It's just like too much of everything, right? Because you are stagnant and everything is hitting you, right? It's bombarding you. I mean, everything from little technologies of Zoom and this Teams and this to you know, how, where are people posting now and be, between checking Twitter and IG and this and that and TikTok, it's just a bombardment of all of that. Um, I think, I mean, your question was more of as, as artists, is it your responsibility to um, learn all this technology? I would say no. I mean, as, as an artist, I think it's your responsibility to figure out um, the best medium to tell your story. And 
Um, I think that it helps to know what's out there because, you know, sometimes in, in seeing what's out there, you kind of figure something that you like, that you're like, oh, I really like this. So a random example that, you know, old school example, but um, when I was in undergrad, um, actually was it undergrad or college, it was when I was in college, um, I was looking at old photographs and I love the way that this particular image looked. And it was, I found out it was something called this photographer, instead of printing their uh, photograph on paper, they print on a you know, photographic paper, they use something called liquid light. And what liquid light is, some of you might be familiar, is basically you can take this liquid that has the emulsion on it and you can put it on any paper and it makes it photographic, right? It makes it um, that you can print on it basically. And I love the imagery, but it was something that was, I was actually going back in time. Um, and so I had to like figure it out and do all this kind of stuff. And, in the end, I wound up taking the image and then tearing it and collaging it. And you, for some images looked amazing. You could tell what they were and some you couldn't. But it, what it did for me, I realized, is that it let me understand, like, I, I, I think at the time I wanted some randomness in it. And I, I and again, now I understand why, because I wanted more moving image. But um, I found something, whether it is to technology or whether it is going back, right, in, in, in time, that I thought, allowed me to express something that um, I just didn't feel like just a regular print would. Um, and, you know, it took some work to figure it out, but I did. Um, that said, I also think that, yeah, it is a lot that's out there and you don't have to, um, you know, completely follow things. I don't think you should judge yourself by that at all. Um, and I, I don't, I, and to be honest, I, a lot of that stuff I think is, is cool and, and new. And I think people want to have like these, you know, new impacts. But again, I think with every medium, it really is just based on the story. If we go back to that and what it is that you're trying to say. Um, and as long as you can communicate that in whatever you, in which way, I think that's, you know, that's, that's the best way to do it. Just out of curiosity, Annie, are you, where are you based? Or where you where do, are you now? I guess everyone's based different places. Oh, I, I, I'm in New York. Oh, you are in New York. Yeah. Can I follow up to this question for Annie and for actually to ask Sarah, but actually to ask all the students? Um, Sarah didn't put it into her presentation, but she sent us a link to um, um, the filmmakers uh, about the digital versus the. Uh, oh right. The. Uh, the film-based film, um, Quentin Tarantino, and I don't know the other man's name. Uh, Roger Deakins. He's right. a cinematographer, and he's shot a lot of, um, you know, like uh, Blade Runner, like the new Blade Runner and stuff. So he's, yeah, he so also knows what he's doing. <laughs> I, have a, I found it very interesting to watch that, and I kind of want to know what Sarah thinks, but I also want to know what the students think, because it does deal with a lot with technology, and I you know, I don't want to project my feelings onto Quentin Tarantino, but it is about a technology. And one guy was saying that it wasn't, Quentin Tarantino was saying that he just doesn't believe it's the way to go. It wasn't authentic to him or putting words in his mouth. But the other guy was saying that, no, it, this is the vehicle that I, it told my story or it did what I needed to do and I could do things even better. So the idea of a technology interrupting or being received well or not was just interesting to see the two guys at odds with it. One, I don't know. I just, Sarah, do you have anything to say about that? Or can students, did you watch that and, and have opinions? Um, if anyone wants to jump in, but I can, um, maybe meanwhile, let me just see if anyone else. But yeah, I mean, I can, so just to revamp, I don't know if everyone got the chance to watch it. If you didn't, just check out the link after. But basically, it's, yeah, Quentin Tarantino. Um, and they weren't in the same room, but it was different excerpts of what he thought about film and people were asking him about kind of the death of film of shooting, you know, um, on film. And um, he is vehemently, but I mean, Quentin Tarantino usually is about everything, but he vehemently is like, oh my God, that's the worst thing ever. This generation is lost. Maybe next generation will bring back film. And he basically said, he doesn't really think the emotion carries when you're using digital. That for him, it's only film that really carries that same magic that, um, and that, you know, the way they can project it and the way that it feels and just kind of um, it, it, that he feels like it's essential to the storytelling for it to be on this, um, you know, so good. 
And then there's Roger Deakins, who's a very well-established and amazing cinematographer who is basically like, listen, I'm done with this conversation. Like I shoot on what's best. And his reasoning is more practical. His reasoning is, you know, I don't want to stay up in the middle of the night and wonder if I've overexposed a, a shot or if, you know, something happens, he's, you know, that I did something wrong. He was like, I can see on set what I've shot. I can see, um, you know, how I can fix it immediately. I can share it. I can sleep well. We could push things where we can say, you know, this looks decent, but what if we did, you know, this? And he was saying that like that allows him more creative freedom because he then can get his safety shots, but then kind of push it because he knows I can see what I'm doing versus with film. He says he sometimes underplays it because he just doesn't want to do anything that might disturb or might actually hinder the image through his experimentation. Um, for me personally, I believe both are valid. You know, again, I think every person has their own. I'm not really a very extremist in terms of, you know, what it is. I can't define for someone else what they think is best for them in terms of how they want to, you know, the same with like, when we go back to Raghavir Singh, I mean, I didn't take any offense from what he said. I completely understood and respected what he said, but it made me question who I was. And I think it's just the same thing. Like, um, you know, I can't, for me, it, 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 technology, but, but for me, I guess, for my personal work, um, I, it's more about the communication of what I want to say and whatever does that best. You know, if it's charcoal, it's charcoal. If it's oil paints, it's oil paints. If it's pencil, it's pencil. Um, but again, that's up to, can I draw in charcoal? Do I even know how to? Is it, you know, is that my ability? Um, and uh, so it really just, I think, depends on, um, you know, each person. I don't know if anyone else feels differently about that. I mean, I'm sure that, I don't know if that question is, relevant for you guys in terms of just still as well, if there's been any pushback about digital versus, um, you know, film. Very little anymore. There used to be a lot of pushback, but if I could just opinionate, <laughs> use, use the form that allows you the freedom to be expressive, but takes care of of it just as Deacon has said, you know, there's no point in trying to, you know, solve problems that the digital can solve, which is not to say you don't, you can just assume that it automatically does it. And again, there's an editing, there's a, a detailed concern about how to use the digital just because you can waste space in a digital space doesn't mean you don't have to be careful about how you frame, how you see, or how it renders. And uh, find the form that allows you to be as free in your expression as possible, truly free. I mean, one big issue about film and still photography, and, I, and also with the moving image, is simply the cost of film. I mean, yes, if you can want to be Quentin Carantino and you have an unlimited budget, but what does a roll of film cost? Uh, and what does it cost to process it and print it? I mean, it's asked, you know, you all can't afford it. Frankly, most of you can't afford it. And why spend that money when you have an alternative to that? And I find as particularly throughout this summer of protest and all kinds of activity where near where I live in Washington Square, I could, can't tell you how many young people I saw walking around with Leicas who clearly did not know how to use them. <laughs> 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 and the expense of not only the film, but the camera <laughs> itself. I thought, my God, give me a break. This <laughs> affectation, I shoot film, I have a Leica. Give me a break. <laughs> Well, <laughs> to, to kind of <clears throat> riff off of that, I do think that there is, a, you know, just right now there's trends, right? There's trends, <clears throat> excuse me, of <clears throat> in, all, in both commercial and video art, right? This idea of nostalgia and this idea of going back. So, you know, you'll see video image that looks kind of messed up or like VHSC and you know, all this kinds of stuff. So there is that 
trend. And I, I do think that part of that might come from this need because everything is so digital. It's kind of what you were saying, Annie, as well. You're bombarded with all this. You want something that you can understand in a way. And that's something that is nostalgic and gives you comfort. Um, and it's something that you want, you know, you kind of um, can look back to and, and feel like, oh, this is kind of cool. But also it, 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 again, it goes back to the idea of emotion. That alone kind of conveys some emotion. Um, but I think what Charlie said is true too, is that sometimes you get a lot of that and it's just, you know, random. Um, but I do think that like the larger question is whatever lets you convey and also what you can, like he said, what you can do at the time. I mean, everything, every creative challenge or every creative act for me is a challenge in that you always have to look at the confine, like the, um, the confines, I guess, that you're producing within. And so you might want to do film eventually. And like you said, if you can't afford it, you train and you figure it out. And then when you can, you find the right project for it. Um, and so, and I also do think that there are some projects that lend themselves to that. For example, if you're doing a period piece or something, and again, hopefully you get the budget for it, but like if you're doing something that really like, it needs that kind of feel, you want it to be authentic in some way, then yes, I think, um, you know, fighting and getting the budget or working it out or whatever it takes, you know, um, makes sense. But again, let, let that, um, the message or let the, you know, what you want to communicate dictate what it is that you need to use. And if it's something that you, you know, it doesn't, the actual medium is not really hindering, again, back to, you know, that story or that emotion, then let it be what it is. Let it be what comes out at the time. But if you feel like in order to, to meet that emotion, and again, it's decisions, right? If you decide that it's what you want to convey really requires you to do something, then, you know, it's like artists that use, you know, human, um, what I was going to say liquids, that doesn't make sense, but you know what I mean? Like bodily fluids or whatever. Like there's some artists that use all kinds of crazy stuff because they feel like that is authenticity to themselves. Um, and I mean, who am I to say, no, it's not like that. That is for them. Again, it's all alignment to what you think is best for you, but be smart. I guess what Charlie's also saying is be smart about when to use it. There's no need to hinder yourself and kind of get involved and not figure out how to work this machine. And you're, you're really supposed to be communicating. So. I think we have one more question and then I think we have to stop though. We would like to go on and on, but. Sarah, it's been very wonderful. Oh, Got one more question, anybody? <laughs> well, well, let me just say one more thing, because I always have to say right? uh, With Annie's question, I think that maybe I mis or misdirected us in a way. Annie, tell me if I'm wrong here, but I think that what we were also trying to talk about or think about was how much technology can we possibly absorb and learn and know how to do everything. Okay. And the one thing I've learned out of so many years is I'm a kind of artist who likes to do everything myself because I'm very much a control. I want to control every, want everything. And I can't necessarily play well with others a lot of times. I'm much better playing in my own little world. <laughs> but what I've had to learn with technology because we have a lot more technology now than we did when I was in school. Um, that I think this might go to Sarah's uh, idea of, of the story, I'm hoping, that if I have a story to tell and I have, and I know what the story is, and I, and I don't have the tool, but I know what I want it to do, then I could find the technician or the person who knows how to do something to help me create that story. Very true, yes. And as long as when you're in school, you get the knowledge of how to deal with technology in a broad sense, I believe, then I have a basic understanding and I know what can be done. I might have to find the person that can do it faster and better than I can, but I have a little bit of knowledge about I know this line can travel in motion, or I, I know this flat print can become three-dimensional. I mean, whatever the thing is, it's what I want. I don't necessarily know how to do it. I think that's great, actually. Uh, and it's very true. Because even with that, if any of you are struggling with, let's say, the moving image or whatever, you don't have to be an expert. Just understand how it works. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking to someone, you can under, you know, or you can understand what the limitations are for your work so that you can be like, well, why can't you do this? And it's like, cause you just can't do that. Or 
you didn't shoot it that way. So I think that's a really good point in that, um, you know, yeah, we don't have to do anything. And I, you know, we, we, even now, like if there are certain things I have to hire someone because I don't, there's a lot of cameras, there's a lot of technology that's come out that I just don't have the time to even look at or learn, but it's really the vision. And again, it's really about your story and about what you want to say. Um, and as long as you are kind of at the helm of that and you make decisions that only further that, then I think, um, you know, you should be all right. You should be all right. Sarah, many thanks. We look forward to next week, the people who are signing up and uh, we will all reconvene again and again, I hope. I hope so. Thank you guys so much. Thanks Very for taking the time. Very wonderful Thank presentation. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you all for coming and uh, everybody be safe, please. Yes. And good luck. Make it through this year. <laughs> <laughs> they will. They're doing great, actually. That's good. It's amazing. You know, they have their doubts, but it's amazing how everybody has it's really adapted to this terrible. <laughs> What a it's time. terrible Zoom. It is. It's, <laughs> There's the age of Zoom. <laughs> it's true. It's every, Zoom everything. It's Thank amazing. You. Sarah, and I'll be <laughs> Thank you all. With you, Sarah. Thank you. And I'll be in touch with you about next week about individual meetings. Perfect. All right, guys. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye.